ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for being here. I am Councillor Elijah Winthrop Farwell. Uh, I am joined here by Ward 1 Councillor Tom Minicello and also Councillor Elijah David Texera. In the back of the room, we have State Representative Jerry Cassidy joining us. Uh, some of you may remember that we had an initial meeting with many of the folks that you see here from Boston Medical Center many, many months ago. And since that time, there has been considerable progress made at the Brain One Nursing and Rehabilitation Center, which will become the Behavioral Health Center for Boston Medical Center. So this will be an update tonight to find out more information about the status of the facility, the personnel and jobs that will be created. Uh, the executive director who will be in charge is here. Uh, we have many other people from Boston Medical Center here. I do want to apologize to you at some point. I have to leave because I made a commitment to get out to Ward 4 to a meeting that Councilor Castro is having on an important issue. Uh, but I will be here for a while, and at this point, I'd like to ask Councilor Minicello to come up and uh, say a few words and join us. Thank you, Councilor Farmer. Uh, again, thank you all for attending. I, um, I was present at that initial meeting, and um, we heard at that time you know, many of the concerns and voices of the community. We um, have had a very good dialogue with uh, Boston Medical Center and all of the people who are involved in this project. Um, one of the issues that was discussed at that initial meeting certainly was um, the safety protocols, the overall operations of the facility. Uh, other people wanted to talk about job opportunities, um, the facility itself, how it will operate. Um, there's going to be some very interesting uh, information provided about the state-of-the-art um, green nature of this facility, uh, one of a kind. Um, so it's uh, going to be a very, I think, interesting and enlightening uh, evening and follow-up to that first initial meeting. And um, we will have a, a, an opportunity for people to certainly ask some more questions. And um, you know, as um, your Ward 1 counselor, if there are issues that um, come up over time, you certainly uh, have my number and people know how to reach me. Uh, I'll be happy to uh, answer questions and get the information that you need. If there's ever concerns with regard to this issue or others, um, I'm very uh, easy to get a hold of. So. Um, Without further ado, we will uh, start the program, and uh, thank you again for attending, and um, we will uh, proceed. Ramon, good to see you. Uh, this is Ramon Soto. He is, uh, he's, uh, uh, the, he's basically the mouthpiece of the Boston Medical <laughs> Center. Um, he is the liaison for the, uh, for the organization, uh, very uh, responsive, whatever we call uh, Councillor Farrell and I gets right back to us. Um, so I look at Boston Medical Center as, as wanting and going to be a good partner with regard to the, to the community here at Brockton. The, the, the people here definitely want this facility to succeed, operate smoothly, and um, they want to be you know, partners in our community with us. This is not a, an organization and a, a group of people that uh, are um, sort of standoffish and hard-headed and um, you know, don't really care and are going to do what they want to do. Not at all. Not, not, not the reception that I've been getting, nor I think Councillor Farwell, um, because if that were the case, um, we would have a different tone with regard to you know, this evening and how things will appear to proceed. So um, again, people are going to um, certainly have their opinions, um, but, but I, I have every, every, um, every uh, uh, notion that this is going to be a partnership that people do care about the community and the city, citizens of Brockton and certainly you know, the west side of Brockton. Um, we all live here and I live here and um, we want it to continue to be you know, a great place to um, raise a family and to, um, and to live in this community. So that uh, being said, Ramon, thank you for attending. And, uh, oh, and again, Councillor David Texera, who is also a Ward 1 resident, uh, is here and we'll be looking over my shoulder as, as uh, Councillor Farwell. They're, uh, they're both uh, going to make sure that uh, I do my checks and balances for uh, the, the ward. Thank you, Councillor Minichello. Thank you for that warm introduction and thank you for your advocacy uh, on behalf of your district. Um, 
you know, and, and also uh, our, our gratitude to Councilor Farwell, who, you know, from day one uh, has been, you know, giving us, you know, the honest truth about what we need to be uh, prepared for and uh, the concerns that the community uh, is raising. Uh, as Councilman Chettle uh, mentioned, you know, we, we have, I have heard a lot from your city councilors. Uh, you should be very proud of that. Um, and this uh, definitely, I think, helped our team to think um, more about the um, programs and operations at our facility, as well as um, just kind of how else we can be a good uh, partner um, uh, with the uh, community. Um, thank you, Councillor Texera. We look forward to working with you as well. Thanks for uh, being here today. Uh, and thank you, Representative Cassidy, uh, as well for your attendance uh, this evening and for your engagement on this issue. And Senator Brady, I'm so sorry I didn't see you walk in. The good senator, thank you very much, uh, as uh, you have been an excellent advocate and supporter as we've been moving through these different points in, the, in this process. Um, the senator has been um, very generous with his time and with his insight and advocacy um, on behalf of this community. So thank you, Senator. Um, with that, I, I have the easiest job. I'm going to be the guy hitting the, the, the arrow key on the, on the keyboard. Um, and so I will now um, hand it off to um, two of my esteemed colleagues. Uh, before I do that, I just want to say, I, this time, if you remember from last time, I remembered my business cards. Um, although I, I'm almost 100% that if you did email me, I responded. If not, please come and tell me after the meeting. Um, uh, but I, I do have my business card, so uh, any questions uh, that arise that don't get addressed during the meeting, please um, you know, introduce yourself to me. Let me make sure I get you my contact info so that we can stay in contact. Oh, and City Councilor Rita Nieves, thank you so much uh, for uh, being here with us today. Um, Councilor Nieves has also been incredibly helpful in providing us with um, uh, feedback uh, throughout this process and you know, letting us know about the community's concerns on, on various issues as well. So thank you, Councilor, for, for being here. I know, I know all of you have a lot on your schedules, and so we will uh, keep this moving. Uh, so now, uh, uh, yes. They're, they're all here to watch me and make sure I'm <laughs> <laughs> so I've got plenty of the council here to block me. Okay, so the pressure's off us. It's on the, the D1 council. Yeah, Good. Exactly. Uh, well, councilors, thank you so much. I, I, I think it says a lot that you all are taking time out of your busy schedules to be here to learn more about this project and to um, hopefully work with us in concert as we um, uh, are uh, moving towards uh, a successful opening. Um, and with that, I would like to introduce my uh, colleagues from uh, Boston Medical Center to kick us off. Uh, uh, first, Dr. David Henderson, uh, a, a, an alumni boxer from uh, Brockton High School. Uh, he is our psychi uh, psychiatrist in chief and the chair of Boston Medical Center's psychiatry department. Uh, and Dr. Ryan Boxhill, he is the chief behavioral health officer for the Boston Medical Center Health System. <laughs> First of all, I want to say good evening and thank you for taking the time to come out to meet with us this evening. Um, we've got some slides prepared. I'll just say I think the big question is why did BMC do this? Um, and it quite simply comes down to this is our mission. If we look at the need for behavioral health, there's unfortunately been a significant need for behavioral health services across the entire state, and Brockton is no exception to that, unfortunately. What we are doing is to try to meet that need somewhat, but we are not going to be able to completely meet the need. As you can see on the slide, there is a need for 250 CSS beds, which is a residential level of care for folks um, going through substance use treatment, and there's a need for 125 inpatient beds. This facility will have 56 inpatient site beds and 26 um, CSS beds. Our mission 
as a hospital really is to change the trajectory of people's lives through healthcare and surrounding them by other wraparound services. And I think one of the things that we have learned over the last couple of years is that even though we're a hospital, in order to really make a difference in folks' lives, we just can't do traditional hospital things. We have to move sort of further up the path um, in order to really meet the needs of our patients and to make a significant change in their lives. When I came to you some time ago, I think this was a 20-something million dollar project. Um, now it's an over 40 million dollar project. So this is a pretty significant investment that we have made um, in behavioral health, which is a service line that is a financial loser. Um, unfortunately, there are significant payment issues with behavioral health, so we're never going to see this investment back from a financial standpoint. But what we definitely will see this investment back is actually making an investment in our patients, being able to make a difference in their lives. The pandemic, unfortunately, has made behavioral health issues even more important. We've seen rates of suicide go up. We've seen uh, wait times in emergency departments across the state and across the country skyrocket. So I would say that this is a pretty timely initiative for us, and we are more than happy to do this in the city of Brockton. Um, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Henderson, who is... I'm so sorry. I just wanted to just add thank you to Representative Cassidy and Senator Brady, who um, the legislature actually did support us with $12 million to help with those upfront costs. <laughs> those were costs. Those are costs that Boston Medical Center would not have been able to recoup without uh, the legislature and, and your uh, local support. Thank you. So yeah, I'll turn it over to Dr. Henderson, who we call the local boy who's made good. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Boxel. Uh, actually, you know, Dr. Boxel said everything I was going to say. So, <laughs> uh, so I'll be brief, but, but I'm really thrilled to be back and to uh, be involved in this initiative uh, uh, in Brockton. Um, as has been pointed out, um, uh, I spent many of my years here in Brockton, you know, from fifth grade all, all through high school and then beyond, of course, when, when I was in college as well. And um, so um, I'm extremely fond of the place. Um, still love like the, I was, I played trumpet in the band, so, so Benny Macrina and, and all of that. And so, so, you know, Brockton really had a huge impact on my life and, and, and provided opportunities for me. And so I'm delighted to be able to provide the community with opportunities such as this. This, this hospital um, is going to be unique and and not only, you know, you know, we pride ourselves we're an academic medical center, meaning that we we really are on the cutting edge of healthcare. And we, you know, that's what that's what the beauty of, of that. Like we're always pushing the envelope, trying to get better, trying to do better for our patients and deliver better care. And so to be able to bring this to the city of Brockton and to have a facility that yeah, I think in short order, you know, right now. Uh, when somebody, you know, you have a family member, member who needs mental health care, you get on the phone, you start calling all over the place, networking and so on, and, and you know, maybe you, you hit upon somebody who, who knows someone who knows someone else, and then maybe your loved one can actually get the care uh, that they, they need. And sometimes people say, oh, send them to McLean Hospital, send them to Mass General, this or that. I think in short order they're going to say, send them to, see if you can get them in in Brockton Hospital. The Brockton, Boston Medical Center's Brockton facility, because I think it's going to be an excellent place for people to receive care and to improve their lives. And, and as you know, mental health, mental illness, it's it's a family illness. It's not just the individual and so on. It, it affects the whole family, and then it affects uh, the community and so on. And so we want this to be a, a healing environment, a place where people come and, and get well, but, but also feel um, like they're human beings, um, and they'll be treated treated well, and so on. And so, uh, a lot of work has gone, and a lot of cost actually has gone into the, the design of the facility, 
Um, and we'll, we'll hear some of those um, unique things um, uh, coming up. So I'm going to turn it over to, I believe, Tracy Wheaton, our, our executive director. Um, we are delighted um, that Tracy is with us. And uh, are you going to introduce her specifically? Or? But you have a whole bio. <laughs> but let me read your bio because, because it's, 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 it's really impressive. Am I on a board? I mean, no, no, you're fine. I'm going to be on a board, too. Though. It's better to have the slides in front of you than behind you. Um, so Tracy Wheaton, she's a, a licensed uh, clinical social worker, and she, she is tasked with leading Boston Medical Center's Brockton Behavioral Health Facility as, as its inaugural executive director. Um, we are so thrilled that we were able to find Tracy and convince her to come to, uh, from Florida, right? Yes, yes. And, and during the winter, I think. Um, <laughs> uh, Tracy was born and raised in Providence, Rhode Island, and has more than 20 years of professional experience working in the behavioral health care and nonprofit arenas. She has spent the past 10 years leading and developing behavioral health systems of care in New Jersey, Massachusetts, and Florida. Ms. Wheaton earned her Master's in Social Work at Boston University, and she is a doctoral candidate in Business Administration with a focus in Health Services at North Central University. So again, we are delighted Tracy is with us, and um, you know, like you know, it's been just a pleasure working with you. You know, the last few months, and I'm really excited about the future. So, oh, welcome. thank you, Dr. Henderson. Thank you, Dr. And good evening to all of you. It's, um, this is my first time meeting all of you, but hopefully not the last. Uh, as Dr. Bob, uh, Henderson mentioned, I am just so thrilled to have been appointed um, to oversee and ensure the safety in therapeutic environment in the new Brockton Behavioral Health Center. I think, you know, being local, um, I, I really know that there is such a growing need for behavioral health care in this community. Uh, and so just really honored and um, looking forward to working with all of you to ensure that we, we make good on our promise to provide exceptional care without exception. And so um, I think that based on what the, some of our counselors, your counselors, have uh, explained to us that it's important to, to let you know and um, to begin to explore the programming that's going to occur at our new location. And as Dr. Boxall mentioned, we will have 56 inpatient psychiatric beds. Those beds will be to, for the treatment of individuals ages 16 and older. So adolescents and adults. Our crisis, uh, our clinical stabilization services are essentially intensive residential treatment for individuals 18 years and older who are recovering, meaning they are past the detox and withdrawal stages of treatment related to substance use disorders. And so as we all know, because none of us escaped the pandemic, none of us in the Commonwealth have escaped the epidemic uh, related to opioid use disorders, um, alcohol dependence, especially with COVID. I can't imagine that everyone in this room doesn't know someone who is struggling with some sort of behavioral health need today. People who had never had a behavioral health issue in their lifetime have experienced some degree due to the pandemic. And so our goal really is to provide a therapeutic, safe, patient-centered, staff-centered environment to treat you, to treat us, to treat your family members, friends, neighbors, sons, daughters, cousins, all of us. This is about all of us. The, the operations will consist of uh, treatment, as I said, provided by psychiatrists, nursing staff, nurse practitioners, case, manager, case managers, psychologists, 
social workers, occupational therapists, peer specialists, behavioral health counselors. We will have such a robust team of trained professionals working at our location. And I think the best news is that out of more than 150 applications to our jobs, 90%, at least 90%, live in Brockton. Yes, we are very proud of that. And, and I think, you know, as we talk about, you know, constantly looking at the numbers, they actually ask me not to so much because we actually have to interview the folks too and, and hire them and onboard them. But I think it's, it's quite safe to say that the doctors and clinicians that will be working at this new location, again, are us. They're you. These aren't strangers. These aren't folks coming from Boston or even Providence, they are, I can't count the number of people who say, I'm just six minutes away from the new location. I just live behind the building. So if anyone is going to ensure that we are providing safe, reliable care, it's going to be our employees because they represent you. They represent us. In terms of the uh, therapeutic in environment, which I understand has reasonably and understandably been in question as we build uh, this new hospital, I, I did think it was, I do think it's important for you to know that all of our staff will be trained in crisis de-escalation and uh, prevention, in violence prevention. In addition, we will have around the clock, 24-7, 365 public safety. And that those public safety officers will be monitoring the grounds, monitoring our cameras, assisting our teams in the event that someone needs a more careful attention and care in order to ensure that, again, you, us, have a meaningful, safe stay in our hospital. Our, our staff will also have personal alarms. So in the event that they need help, easy as clicking a button, no matter where they are in the location. So we have really gone above and beyond to ensure that the services we are implementing in this hospital are state of the art. We have not minced, as, as Dr. Boxwell mentioned, we are $20 million over what we anticipated because it's the right thing to do. And we want to make sure that our patients and our staff and you, our community of friends and neighbors, know what's going on, get the help that you need in a safe way. In addition, I think it's important for you to know that we will be uh, working with other hospitals, the Boston Children's Hospital and um, Williams James University and Massasoit Community College on an initiative to hire people. So if you have, and this is also a plug, so if you have um, your family members who are interested in working in the behavioral health field, they may have just graduated from college or even high school, and are interested in working in behavioral health but don't have the skills or the experience, we are partnering with Massasoit, William James, and Boston Children's to um, have a cohort of individuals who we hire and so that they can get the on-site training and education through a certification to, to work at the hospital. And with that initiative, those individuals will also have access to growth. So if they really like being in the, in the location and wanted to go back for their bachelor's degree or a master's degree, we, are, um, we will support them in that. So again, I, think, I just think that it's so important that this hospital 
Well, understandably, um, I understand where you're coming from, because I live in Bridgewater, in, right next to Bridgewater like, State Hospital. So I very much understand the anxieties and concerns around having a behavioral health hospital in the community. Um, but I think it's also important to understand that we're all in this together, and, and we would never, ever do anything intentional um, to put any of us at risk, because most of us uh, will also be residents of the community. And so, yes, that's right. I was so wrapped up into talking about the cohort. <laughs> um, so we also are working with city councilors to, and the mayor, um, to host a job fair in Brockton. And so I don't know where yet, but we're working on the details, and that will definitely be blasted. And uh, again, I just can't say enough how much we invite you to um, refer your friends, family members, and yourselves, even if, you know, you're not necessarily looking for employment. Uh, we certainly also welcome volunteers. Uh, there's going to be a lot to do, so if you enjoy arts and crafts and um, exercise, we welcome uh, everyone to be a part of this really amazing uh, project. Lastly, and then we'll take questions, I, we wanted to share with you our timeline. So as you know, and because um, you can't miss it when you drive by, the fences that are up and, and, and the men and women at work, our construction um, at our location, located at 34 North Pearl Street, which was the old Graymore nursing home, is due to be completed at the beginning to mid-August. And, and, and so we are well underway. We actually have um, walls going up, primer on the walls. It's really pretty incredible to see. We're also in the throes, as I have mentioned, of staff recruitment, which is just going to be ongoing. Um, however, we do need a substantial amount of individuals in order to get the building up and going uh, come October. We have also met with numerous stakeholders, some of you who may be in this room right now, um, to, to make sure that we are not only being good stewards and neighbors, but we're being good partners to ensure that from beginning to end, our patients have access to the appropriate care. Um, I have used services in Brockton um, when I've had health needs, and I can't tell you how many times I, I've seen people just needing care and, and having to wait for it because there's just no beds available. Um, in, in fact, there's nearly a thousand people in the Commonwealth who are, who are in emergency departments right now waiting on inpatient levels of care. 300 of them are youth. So, you know, while this is a, a, an amazing initiative, we, have, we still all have a lot of work to do. Um, we are a part of the Brockton Hill Coalition, which is a community uh, partnership that you may be aware of that meets monthly to, again, just figure out ways to work together and, make, and keep each other honest in ensuring that we're providing a continuum of care, a system of care, stages in the process of care from beginning to end for our patients. We will continue those stakeholder engagements and you all, everyone in this room is a stakeholder and, and so we are just more than happy and willing and wanting to work with all of you, hear from all of you, and invite you to join us in our journey in improving behavioral health care in our community. Thank you. Before we go on, I'd like to have facilities. 
something that I know I'm really proud of, and I'm sure he's proud of it too. Talk to the green initiatives. Um, when we met with your mayor, he talked about and was very proud of all the firsts that Brockton has. And I think this adds another first, where this will be, as far as we know, the first carbon control, net zero, behavioral health facility in the entire country. So I think that's another thing that we can be all proud of that we're doing. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so I, you know, I started my career uh, in community hospitals. And for me, doing the work to make it a, a net zero facility is emblematic of our commitment to the community. You know, it starts with being good stewards of the environment that we're all in. And so, you know, we've uh, invested a, a significant amount of money to upgrade the facility to make it fully net zero. Um, you may have seen we're reskinning the facility with insulation, you know, what's called an EFIS uh, insulation, uh, to make it uh, much tighter for, uh, from weather and for heat transfer. Uh, all new uh, windows are going in the entire facility um, as we speak. Um, the only fossil fuel in the entire building will be the diesel generator for emergency backup. Um, all of the heating and cooling is going to take place uh, using ground source heat pumps and geothermal. Uh, so we've drilled and have completed the drilling of uh, about uh, 88 uh, wells that are uh, 500 feet deep and into the earth uh, that we will use for storing the heat uh, in the cooling uh, for the building uh, and then and draw it out depending on the season. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think the other thing that's very unique is that we've done this all by reusing uh, an old facility and not having to, to tear it down and build new one. To save all of that construction material, which is uh, extremely unique for this, this type of facility. So. so, I think at this point, um, unless there's anything else to add, um, uh, oh, I also want to mention that we have our Chief of Public Safety, um, Connie, who's here as well. Um, and so, at, at this point, I, I want to open it up to uh, question, and, question and answer. Um, I have, I did grab a, uh, okay. because since we have one microphone, I, I have an alcohol light and then I will basically try to shuttle back and forth. Um, so appreciate your patience as we, and then if, if folks can speak loudly, I know that Brockton Cable is also recording. Um, so maybe in the interest of time, if folks get up and can at least speak on here, it will be recorded. Um, so that it can be viewed um, later. Uh, so with that, I'll open it up. Questions? share with you is the staffing if you don't know this we've actually had security officers at the site since April you know they're, they're protecting the site getting used to it as we hire full-time officers as he said 24 7 365 days a year there'll be two to three officers on site um, they'll so we, we build these um, buildings with like the layers of an onion so we start with the exterior which will have the fencing the gates for the parking lots there'll be cameras There'll be emergency call boxes for the employees coming and going. There'll be intercoms at the front door and at the ambulance delivery. And then there'll be metal detectors. There's a quite robust access control where you have to use your badge to get onto the unit, get in the elevators, get everywhere within the facility. Uh, I think there was a concern, you know, should people get into the stairwell, should people get to the exterior grounds? We built it so there's like three mechanisms of delay and deterrence. You go to a stairwell, you hit the crash bar, we get in there and along. So we're gonna know there's some activity. When you get into the stairwell before you get to the next exit point, there's another delay. So alarming to the officers who are on site to respond as well as panic alarms on the units describing who and where each individual may have gone. Uh, we don't see it a lot, but should it happen, we'll be well prepared. I reached out to Chief Perez of the Brockton Police. I have not heard back from her yet regarding whether they can facilitate using reverse 
uh, call up 911 if there was an alert to the community. That's how we've done it before. At our main hospital, we do rely on the Boston Police to take description, response, return people, you know, notify family if they've gone there. But um, there is a police presence involved that will assist our staffing for security on the site. Does that answer your question? Thank you, Connie. All right, so I, I, I saw a hand. Oh. I have two questions. One, it deals with the training of the staff that you, that you mentioned. Um, after listening to some of the descriptions, I wanted to know a little bit, is this a training hospital? Or how many of the of the people working there are fully licensed and what is their background? And are you just bringing in new people and training them or how? What's happening? That's number one. Number two, how will the community, the immediate community, I'm not talking about the whole city of Brockton, but the immediate community, how will we know if there's a breach at the, at the facility and how fast will we know it? Or what's going to happen if there is? You know, what protocols are you going to take? I don't care about inside the facility and around it. You probably build fences and lights and beeps and all that. But what about us? Right outside the, the facility. How will we know? If we're in the yard, if we have kids running around, what are you gonna do if there's a breach? How fast will we know it? That's what that's what our interest will be in. And I think what you should do, and if you haven't done it already, is provide the immediate residents of a list of your protocols, what you intend to do for us in, in this facility if there is some security um, problem. Give us, give us a, this information in writing so we can feel comfortable. We don't care about the lights that you're putting in and the doors and the windows and the fences. We care about what happens when they go out of there. That's our concern, because you're already there. And we want to know what people are working there. What's their background? Are you just bringing in necessary people and training them? I mean, that's what schools do. This is not a school. This is a very intense place that we want to feel secure. You're dealing with a lot of residents that have a lot of small children coming and going on school buses, which I think is a, 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 a ridiculous to have a place like that. Being a school teacher, I feel it's ridiculous, but anyway. What are you going to do for us? Never mind within the facility. Of course, you provide a care for them. But we want to know what's, what's going to happen if someone comes out. How long is it going to take for us to know? A day? Another question. As I mentioned, I can't speak on behalf of Chief Perez on what they do to notify you of incidents now, hurricanes, floods, you know, missing other children. You know, from school, how quickly you get alerted, whether they use the news media. That's what I've done at other facilities. So I can't answer, I can't speak on behalf of what she plans to do. But I will tell you, one of the things we've looked at, at our hospital, we have an alert system that goes to your phone. It's immediate when there's a certain alert that's happening at the hospital, blood, fire, anything. And we have looked at vendors that can certainly, you know, we would put at this facility and you can opt in to get those alerts. One has not been chosen you know, in all transparency. But having an alert system that comes right to your phone quickly, almost like when they put out the Amber Alerts for children, that's what you want to see. Well, two things on that. One, if you're having this meeting, you should contact the chief director. I have. I know, but you should have those protocols in place when you're talking to those things that you have. You have plenty of time to take this in action. Secondly, what about some people don't have their phones and, and, at that point? How are they going to get notified? You know, we're not, we're not tied to our phones all the time, getting these sheets and phones and things like that. We're busy. Right. So and what's going to happen? And I will tell you. No, I will tell you in the city of Boston when we've had incidents in particular neighborhoods, they use the police vehicles to be able to broadcast that, to stay in, shelter in place. We did it during the marathon, we did it everywhere. But again, I, I'm making an assumption that the Brockton police would do that. But that's your quick notice if you're not on the phone, if you're in the supermarket versus your home at all, and you want to know I can't get back home because of a situation may not even be in this facility, there's something else in the neighborhood. But that's what I'm following up on. To answer your question, I have emailed and called and we're still right. touching base. Well, again, to, to point out that maybe the councils are involved, not putting this in action first before we have a meeting. They should have had the protocols in place because not maybe this will happen and I'll get back to you. This is the second meeting. You've had all this time. The most important questions we had last time were on security. And yet you still don't have a protocol of what's going to happen. Maybe the police are going to go around and go, maybe they're going to do that. You're voting in August, and you don't 
Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, uh, all of your concerns are very reasonable and um, human, they're human concerns. You said you're a teacher, yes. right? And so, our country over the past 20 years have, have, has experienced some really horrible situations in our communities, especially around our youth and our schools. And so, and, and while we all have a lot of work to do, you know, there, um, it's going to take a village. So while, so while we, so having the location in Brockton, it, like there are hospitals everywhere. I mean, there's Good Sam's, there's um, the uh, Brockton Hospital, and behavioral health patients are in and out of there all of the time. There, it's, it's really up to us, like Connie said, to make sure that when we, when we know, we notify through an alert system in collaboration with our public safety um, officials and all of you. But it's also, if you see, see, see something, or say something. It's about us partnering to make sure that those lines of communication are, are always open. And um, in working together, to come up with a plan yeah. because the plan should have been in place. Good yeah. We know about say something, say something. But I'm talking to all of you. You can't give it a second time. Our question is about security. And yet you don't have details. Even the councils I would call don't have details of how you're going to protect the immediate residents that are around that facility. We know what to do with this. I've lived in that area for over 30 years. I know all about it. I've been a school teacher for 30 years. I know all about it. So don't come into the village if it takes the units. I know that. But if it takes five people there to get information, and you don't have the drugs, when are you going to have it? When you open in August? No, you know, you are absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Fully licensed, fully trained, 
the, the trainees are a bonus to us. They're, they're not required, and in fact, we will start off the, in October, we will start off without trainees. And once, you know, and then the, the trains will not actually start to come to our facility until, uh, this, you know, two, in January of 2023. Um, so, but we are, we are committed to training the future mental health specialists. And that's what we do, right? And, and so, um, if, if, if you go to the Boston hospitals that are teaching the hospitals, I think what makes them special is that they have a bunch of experts and then they have a bunch of trainees who put in extra work to care for every patient. And so, it, so we believe it's, a, it's an important part of our mission. Um, it, it, it will actually improve care, not take away from care. Um, and and it will it'll, it'll allow us to provide opportunities and to produce the next generation of mental health professionals. So we're completely committed to that. I just want to follow up on the concerns about the, the patients in the facility. So I, I've now managed, um, you know, this is probably my third uh, facility that has an inpatient behavior all. You know, and they're, they're present all over the state. Narrows Waco Hospital, the Old Malden Hospital, there's a few patient behavior health uh, units here, McLean, Middleborough, and these types of facilities. This is not a correction facility. This is for people who need inpatient behavior health services. And so, in, in my experience, these units tend to be in some of the safest units um, because of the level of protections that we put in place for the patients. Whereas, you know, many incidents can happen just in a regular medical surgical uh, environment. Uh, we also will have patients who may have medical issues, but also be involved. And so, you know, I really believe that you're going to find that this is an extremely quiet facility. I know Middleborough about that. My understanding is Middleborough actually had a requirement to open that facility originally that they had to have public safety on site. I believe it was 24 7. And then they ended up kind of pulling that back as a community because they found it was extremely quiet and safe. So, and I believe you're going to find the same thing. Okay, right in the middle. I'm going to do a quick account if you can because last time there was one woman who I, I, I missed. Oh. Um, no, 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 you go ahead. I just want to, can folks raise your hands real quick so I make sure not to miss it. Yeah. Hi, my name is Steve Morris. I live uh, about 250 yards from the front door of on the way more than I up to So I'm a very concerned neighbor. I, uh, I want to welcome you to the neighborhood. I also want to apologize to uh, our fine local officials that all showed up in you people that we don't have the representation that I hope for. And the only reason I think we don't have the representation is because they looked at it as a fait accompli. Done. If you want to zone for this, you're going to come in here, and it's it's done. And it's just the safety issues that they would like to have addressed. I know there's nine people on my street who will be here, but they knew I was coming. They didn't need to come. <laughs> so you can say there's nine more seats here that are filled. I also know that because Paul is here, that they feel very well represented because he's out of George Washington, you know. <laughs> and uh, and there's many other people, Ray, Susan, and uh, but. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you to the counselors for uh, all of you for coming here. You know, the representatives over here have been so fundamental in us not having uh, an oversized apartment building there instead we have your people coming in and you're serving a need for uh, country needs, mental health facilities. You know, uh, I think we all recognize that. I uh, personally, I mean, the, the most fundamental thing for me was what I would like to see happen is uh, that no one, there's no in and out. No, nobody checks themselves in, checks themselves out. That there's transportation back and forth. That someone is gets a ride home. I don't care if it's my next door neighbor. They'll have to be driven 300 yards. I would like everyone that needs the facility to get a ride there. Everyone that's admitted to the facility to get a ride there. And no, it's not a clinic. It's not an open door to everyone like that. I also want to thank you, Mr. Soto. I've emailed you a few times and you emailed me right back. And 
I like that kind of response. It's, it's a great thing. But, um, but that's really what I would like to see. I would like to see nobody. It's not an open door. You know, because we are. There's a park right there. There's a school right up the street. Oh, excuse me. This is it. <laughs> there's, there's also an un. Man, there's an unpatrolled, if you will, cemetery right next to your facility and all that stuff. And in the past, we have had problems in the neighborhood with the cemetery and with the park. You know, they've been cleaned up, but then again, that deteriorates after a while. As long as my my only concern is that is that your patients are transported in and out of the facility and be the greatest thing. You know, I would feel very safe otherwise. And I thank you for what you do. I, I realize you'll never be return on your investment, you know, not even close, you know. This is kind of done by some of the finest people on earth, doctors, nurses, people, that administrators that do what you do, you know. So thank you. Well, welcome to the neighborhood. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Mayor. Steve, thank you for those comments and questions. I just want to say that we have addressed those. Patients coming to, they will be coming by Ambulance, there'll be no one that will be walking out the facility. Um, and I'll say this I grew up, well, my later teenage years in New York on Froy Ave between Linden and Lenox. And the reason I say that is because it is about half a block away from the entrance of the Kingsboro State Psychiatric Facility, right? Where it's not this facility where they actually keep people who are criminally insane, right? So that's where I grew up, a half a block away from that. So I, I completely get the concern about safety. Um, I think we've done our due diligence to address that. There's not one square foot of this facility that is not under 24-7 surveillance. I think what you'll find, as Bob said, is with Middleborough is that you'll just go, there's a very nice facility in my neighborhood. I have no idea what goes on there. There's not going to be people coming and going. There's not going to be noise. And that's, previous to this, I ran the largest inpatient site behavioral health operation in the state. It would be a shame if folks walked away from this meeting concerned about, and I get it, it's Hollywood, right? There's some mad person on the loops that's going to get into your backyard and harm you. It's not going to happen. It is extremely, extremely unlikely that there is going to be anyone walking away from this facility. One, on the patient side, is just not possible. Two, on the CSS side, these are folks who have completed detox, have said, I want my sobriety is important to me. I want to continue my sobriety. And we're also getting the assurance and making sure that they've agreed that they just can't say at 11 o'clock at night, I want to leave. That they're going to leave when we have arranged arrangements for them to leave. And so again, I think it's an amazing opportunity and it would be a shame if we just focus on the security. And yes, I get it. And I'm here to answer all questions and take responsibility for everything, right? With a lot of, you know, with, we're both chiefs, and with chiefs come responsibility. And so, but again, I wanna really have folks really think about what's really going on here in a time when people are struggling. I think like Tracy said, everybody is struggling. There, it is impossible to really talk about the impact that this pandemic has had on folks. And before the pandemic, behavioral health was a, a big crisis. I mean, we're seeing kids come into the emergency department with no history of behavioral health before, zero. And they're coming in after committing some pretty severe acts of trying to kill themselves because of this pandemic. And typically we can see this and we can predict this. And we can say, well, we've seen Ryan before because he's got a chart. And there's no, red flags for us. And so we get the urgency of this. And again, this isn't some facility where we're gonna have somebody who's criminally insane or, you know, like, like Hollywood. These are going to be our family members, our friends, 
our neighbors. Everybody in this room, including myself, at some point in their life, will meet criteria for a behavioral health disorder. No repeat that. Virtually everybody in this room, at some point in their life, myself included, will meet criteria for a behavioral health disorder. And the facilities to treat them are far and few. And this is an opportunity to bring this to Brockton and to bring jobs. And I'll say again the question about trainees. The problem with behavioral health that I have to deal with is that the reimbursement rate is low, but the cost is extremely expensive. To get a PhD, I had to go to school for six or seven years, and that's after getting a bachelor's degree. If you look at all these professions on here, these are people that just go to college and then show up and say, I want to provide this here. You have to go beyond that. So we're talking about some of the most highly skilled and people who had to invest an incredible amount of time and money into their education. So this isn't a place where you just show up and say, I can provide treatment. The standard is extremely high to reach. And that, unfortunately, is why there's not a lot of behavioral health resources. Because after people put all that money and time into their education, they don't say, well, I can't really afford to go treat folks who are in the working class. And so if you're in Massachusetts, typically you can't afford to pay $200, $300 an hour, you will have a very hard time finding resources. And the thing I'm proud of and that we're proud of is that we said, you know what, we're going to build a facility and the standard is, if I don't want to go there and it's not good enough for me or my family members, it's not good enough for our patients. And that's why we spent $40 million. And Bob will tell you, we've had, we meet Friday morning with the architects, and I'll say to them, no, that's not good enough. We want more enhancements, right? And the, the proof is in the pudding. This isn't something that we're just sort of doing and we can walk away from. This is a significant investment because we are serious about providing the care that's needed. And that has only, and I wish I were wrong. I wish I could stand here and tell you I'm wrong. But I'm 100% confident, unfortunately, with what we've seen in the pandemic, that the need for these services is just going to continue to skyrocket before you. Um, hello everyone, my name is JC Alvita and um, I live across the street. So I understand that your services are needed, um, that's a point well taken. I understand your um, facility is going to be well secured, but to her point, safety is a concern. I have an 18 year old, um, so I do worry. Now, I'm not going to beat a dead horse, but I also want to know what protocols do you have in place for your patients once they leave the facility. I think you mentioned that you know you will put them in a car and send them back home, but what's to stop them from getting off and you know coming back, hanging out at the and some of these people may not have a home to go to, right? Um, so what do you what services do you provide once they're ready to leave? That's a really great question. Um, so basically, uh, everyone who comes into our um, who will come into our location undergoes like a screening process for admission to make sure that they meet criteria for whatever service uh, they might be looking for. On the day of admission, we begin to work on the discharge. So, and that's where like case managers, social workers come to play, community partners, because. We can't, based on the just requirements Massachusetts has put in place and, and they're growing, we can't just discharge somebody to the street without a resource. We can't do it. Even if it means keeping them in our location without being reimbursed, we can't, we have to make sure people have a safe discharge. And so in leaving and coming to, well, coming and leaving the, the, the location, it's a company. So whether it's an ambulance, when they get coming into the location, and an Uber help, or a family member, or the neighbor coming to give them a ride home, it isn't a company transport. Um, so I hope that answers. I hope that answers your question. Well, it kind of does, but do you follow up with them to see where they are? Yes. You know, yes, it's a great. 
Yes, so they, we do. We, we have, um, so the Department of Mental Health and Department of Public Health do have uh, regulations in place whereby we have to make sure people are being connected to, number one, a treatment um, location within a certain amount of days post-discharge. Um, number two, that we're not discharging people for homelessness. We actually have to report that to the state. Um, and so, and that's where a lot of the times, it might in other places, in my experience, it's been we've kept people on the unit because they have nowhere to go. And if, even if it's that, look, their housing is coming up, and we're working with like self shore housing or something like that, we have to, we can't just discharge the person to the street. The other piece is, is what we're doing, which many hospitals don't do for behavioral health, is we're actually following up within 30 days post-discharge. So there'll be follow-up immediately post on the day of discharge uh, to make sure that that final, in the final hour, that disposition and that next step is secured. And then there will be a, a staff member who follows up with the patient to make sure that they got to where they needed to be. And if they have it, we're gonna work with that person to make to either bring them back if that's what they need, or to advocate with the next service provider to make sure they get into that appointment or that housing or what medical appointment, whatever it is. Hi, my name is Susan. Um, I have two questions, and one is um, going to be a lot nicer, so I'll ask that one first. Um, is there going to be an opportunity to tour the facility? Okay. Yes. Um, is it going to be an open house or just you know arrangements for? Uh, um, I think what we'll end up doing is I'll follow up with the counselors, and then we'll set up uh, a time that uh, works on their schedules as well so that we can then do a walkthrough once the, the walls are up. Okay, thank you. Um, the other question might be more towards Brockton Police and the counselors, but um, I don't have a problem at all with this facility. I think, you know, I should say it's much needed. Um, my concern is, uh, is it going to attract elements who might want to take advantage of people who are in the facility and try to sell drugs or something. So in other words, it's outside of the facility that I'm a little worried about. And that, that might be a Boston police question, um, you know, so that people aren't lurking around to try to take advantage of people who are using the facility. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll just speak to it from the design of the facility perspective. It is one of the things we've thought about. Um, you know, so for instance, the outdoor area that we've designed uh, within the U of the courtyard, so we've, we've created kind of two levels of security there. Uh, so that we have, um, you know, one level of security for where the patient outdoor area is, but then a second level of security so that people couldn't try to come around the facility and pass things over or even throw it to try to break their distances, distances to make sure that type of interaction can't happen so that we're not attracted. For, uh, thanks for coming today, guys. Um, wish you the best of luck with everything. Just a little bit of like, uh, background. I worked in Boston for a while. Um, now I live with, like, uh, right on the way, right down off Sunset Road. Um, I've been there for seven years. I love the neighborhood. Uh, I've got great neighbors. Don't want to leave. Um, when I was in Boston, I remember 2014, the Long Island Bridge shut down. Remember? Out to Moon Island. And Right after that, the mass, mass Ave, right, NBU, BMC, became a bad problem for about five, six years. It was a blight on society. Um, my question to you is, what uh, type of demographics are going to be of people that are we going to see? Are they going to be from the South Shore? Are they going to be from Boston uh, coming down towards this facility? And who's going to pay for it? Is it going to be on the shoulders of the Brockton taxpayers, or is it going to be paid for by Boston Medical Center, all the patients there? 
And then just uh, on uh, her point, um, you know, I, I drive down Legion Parkway in Main Street every day, and it's even in a, on a nice day, it doesn't look good. I, I drove into Boston down uh, Blue Hill Ave in Roxbury, Mattapan, and that place ain't been there in, in six months, and it was really sad. So, you know, I just want to know what, what, who's paying for this? And it, you started off your presentation by saying that this is, we're not going to make any money. This is not a money-making venture. We're doing this to, that's great. I mean, I, I wish I could, I wish I could do that and lose money every day. But who's going to foot the bill? And is it the city of Brockton? Is it the, is it the state of Massachusetts? Or, and, and you know, that's my, that's my question. Thank you. Yep. Coming from, with all due respect, coming from uh, Florida, that is a great question. And one that um, makes a whole lot of sense. And I say that because they don't have Medicaid expansion. And there's still people who need help. And somebody got to pay for that help, right? So the patients uh, who, are, who will be coming to the Rockland facility, the majority will be on either uh, Mass Health, Medicaid, or Medicare due to a disability um, or a low income. So the state. And yeah, so, so the, the state, state unless yeah. well, the state unless they're in a cost share program because we do have with the Affordable Care Act we do have um, Medicaid expen expansion in Massachusetts. But essentially, if people are income eligible or disabled and it's, it's entitled to that based on Massachusetts laws, then that's who would be paying. Uh, other what, pay if, what if I did? What if no one had? What if no one had health insurance and they just showed up? Yeah. So if no one has health insurance and they and they show up and they're not eligible for like Mass Health or they can't take private pay, then we we take them. Then BMC is that. That's on us. So that's not on the taxpayers of Brockton or on the state of Massachusetts, that's on the MC. And that's where, you know, in any hospital healthcare system, there's a variety of payer mix, uh, payer mix like Medicaid, Medicare, commercial, people service, um, or anybody who can support that. I'm certainly not in that category. But um, and, and, and there's always some sort of give and take because this, this is America, the greatest country on earth. There's always going to be someone who needs, and there's always going to be someone who helps. And in this role, the MC would be that role, person. I, I think it's not going to be the same. I think Brian was going to finish the. Oh, I'm sorry. We'll, we'll come back. Sorry, we just want to make sure we finish, about that. we finish this answer. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'll try to be brief. In terms of. Behavioral health, if someone has, like Tracy said, well, they have Medicaid or not, unfortunately, to pay for all these professionals is very expensive. What we get reimbursed for does not cover that. So basically, the hospital is going to eat that cost, right? Because the reimbursement rate does not cover the cost of providing care. Um, the question about people coming and going, it's a very easy question to answer. Because this is what we call a freestanding facility, everybody that comes to that facility has to be screened and chosen to come to that facility. It is different than, let's say, a Good Sam or Rockton Hospital where you just show up and say, I'm here for here. It's a freestanding Site facility. So everyone that comes there needs to apply. They need to get screened by a physician and a treatment team who goes over that person's situation. Then they have to be approved. And you also approve the time that that person shows up. And so I'll answer the other question around. Um, so there, there's not a concern about like there's going to be people coming and going because the beauty of a free static facility is okay, yeah. can't happen. Yeah. They have all, we have ultimate control. No one shows up there unless we screen 
and tell them that they can show up and actually tell them what time that they can show up. The other thing, if we look at neighborhoods that have behavioral freestanding facilities, there's one right in the center of a multi-million dollar neighborhood in Brooklyn, right? That issue doesn't come up. So I think this is the advantage of having a freestanding facility that those sort of concerns can't happen. Nobody can show up um, and say, I'm here, I want here. Oh, and the question as to who, look to your left and look to your right. Those are the people that we're going to be treating. And I'm not saying that to be coy, because again, I think there's this sort of boogeyman idea as to who's going to this facility. These are going to be the citizens of Massachusetts. Now, many of these folks are going to be folks who are on Medicaid, but there's not going to, there's, again, these are our brothers, our sisters, our aunts, our uncles. I can't really stress that enough. Right, the patients in the AC. I just want to make sure that, 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 that they're really covered. Yeah, so again, this is a facility that's about treating the citizens of Massachusetts who need help. And it's not, again, like TV. People think behavioral health, they think of somebody out in the street screaming naked. This is our uncle. This is the person who comes home at night and has two glasses of wine and thinks that's okay, not realizing. If you have two glasses of wine at night, you got a problem, right? And that's a lot of people don't realize that. Those are sort of the people that we're treating. It's going to range. That's not going to be the only people being there. But again, this is about those folks who are having difficulty. People who are saying, life has been difficult. I don't have the same amount of joy or enjoy life the same as I used to. This is about trying to get folks back on track. And I think the big mistake that happens with behavioral health is we think that it's not us. And those are the folks who are most likely to have an adverse outcome from behavioral health. Because they don't realize that, one, they have a behavioral health issue and they don't seek help. Because they think, well, I'm not talking to myself, so therefore, this facility isn't for me. That's, that's the extreme. This is about the regular folks who need help. A lot of them are suffering from trauma. The majority of our patients suffer from major depression. Overwhelming majority of them have a major depression diagnosis. Those are people who have a hard time getting up out of bed. Thank you. So um, we have uh, a few minutes left. Um, Okay. I don't want to minimize the, the issue of security, but I, I want you to consider a couple of things. And many of you know I spent decades in law enforcement. On any given day, Brockton District Court releases people who are charged, presumed innocent, but charged with very serious crimes they walk out the front door of that courthouse and they go back to your neighborhood. Probably don't get the treatment they need. Maybe they sold fentanyl. Maybe they are out with a weapon. Maybe it was terrible domestic violence and the, and the woman was severely injured. Or a man could be severely injured, I suppose. But this facility is going to have a level of structure security, intake protocols, discharge protocols that far surpass any state agency that I can think of. And I'm not denigrating the courts, I'm just telling you the way it is. The other thing I want you to consider is that, and I have to go to Market Basket, you will go to different supermarkets. When you shop at Market Basket, you are probably walking by someone who is severely depressed. You're probably walking by somebody who's psychotic. You're probably walking by somebody who should be inpatient somewhere, but either because of the stigma or the reluctance to seek treatment or for some other reason they don't do it. Those are the people I worry about. 
I'm not going to worry about the people that seek treatment here with our Boston Medical Center staff. And so I think it's so important in life to pay attention to what the young lady mentioned about security and to think about protocols and to think about cooperating with the Brockton police. But I do think we need to put everything in perspective. And I would much rather have more facilities like this who will help people. And you know, I jokingly say this, but the way the economy is going, if you think we have to press people now, let's wait till six months from now. So um, I'm just very proud that Joe Brockton. I do know that there will be progressive and periodic updates to what we do. But I got to tell you, folks, the need is there, and the need is with all of our friends and relatives, and people we know, people we pass on the street, and and I think it's going to be six months after it's open. I think it's going to be something that we're proud of, and we're going to say, gee, I don't understand why there was so much controversy. That's usually the way these things go. So, uh, but thank you for listening, and uh, I certainly wish all of you. Thank you very much, Councillor. So, uh, sure. Uh, so I just want to make sure in the interest of time that I make sure I ask one more time before we have a, a re repeat question. And I do see someone in the corner. I'm going to run. Go on. I don't think I need that. <laughs> I'll use it anyway. Um, I'm here on behalf of my parents' home who abuts the Braymore Nursing, the old Braymore Nursing Home. I was just wondering how you would get messages or notify or talk to people that live right around you. Like that, you were talking about stakeholders or whatever. How do you, uh, because last time they didn't even know that this type of facility was going in. Um, we read it in the paper. Um, but I was just wondering how you would notify the neighbors that we about the property. Thank you. I mentioned a little earlier there's a couple of ways of doing it. Without speaking to Chief Perez, I can't you know, assume one way or the other, but I do know that what I've used at other facilities and even around the prisons is that you can have an alert system that will go to a mobile application and it's immediate, like they do with Amber Alerts for children, and then they also have um, use the police vehicles in response to the, as they're checking out the neighborhood they may be able to announce, the, announce over their um, vehicles what they're looking for and that would be the alert that we would get you now if you're not home and you start to drive home and you see a bunch of police vehicles that's something that we have to discuss with the rocket police okay that's you know i just like like you were saying like if we were to tour the building or stuff like that i understand the I had my father in Boston Medical. I, I love the security that was there Great. at the time in Boston. I'm just talking about what is like the building of it. Um, you know, like if we can tour it, and, and that's the type of stuff. Yeah, so we will coordinate with Councillor Sparwell and Minicello uh, in, in regards to setting up a time to host the community for a tour of the facility. And I think then you'll really get a, a you know, a keen uh, eye on the security, the, the you know triplicate security levels of security that are in the facility, which would make it you know almost impossible, essentially, um, uh, for someone to go out without uh, something being um, or someone coming to that uh, to that person. So I, I just want to um, oh sorry, I'm sorry. So just want to make sure that no one else who hasn't asked a question. Yes. Hi, um, I, my name's Chris. I'm actually a reporter with the Enterprise, the paper that's here. So I just, I just actually wanted to ask, um, you know, one of the things that you have made the point is that, you know, these are our neighbors, our brothers, our aunts, or whatever. Um, so I wanted to ask, and this might not be something that you are prepared to answer right now, but what exactly is the treatment going to be like, and how are you going to ensure that it's actually effective so that people aren't you know, coming back and then leaving and then coming back and then leaving. What what is it? What is sort of the the plan going to look like? Yeah. 
So I can talk a little bit about the, the treatment. So the treatment basically is a combination. Um, we're going to have occupational therapists. We will have uh, what we call psychopharmacology, which is the treatment through psychiatric medications. And we will have psychological interventions. So there will be one-on-one -on -one counseling. This facility will also have uh, psychologists there. And there will also be what we call group treatment based on a cognitive behavioral therapy model. One of the things that's going to be unique about this and one of the innovations that we're bringing from BMC is BMC has probably the most prestigious treatment, uh, sorry, training for psychologists and what we call cultural competency. And cultural competency is basically where you're not assuming that everybody is the same, but you're looking at their values, their religion, their beliefs, and you're incorporating that into how you provide care for those individuals. And given that we are sort of the national leader in the treatment and the training of psychologists, and we've done it for years under Dr. Henderson, we will be leveraging that and bringing that to the facility also. As you know, Brockton has a very diverse uh, patient population, and that's one of the things we're proud of at BMC, is being able to tweak the treatment to meet the different um, cultures, and religions, mores, values, of our patient population and not say we're going to treat everybody the same. So whether that's, you know, addressing issues that may be specific to folks who are Latinx or African American or the LGBTQ community, all those things we're going to be very um, intentional, intentional about making sure that that's incorporated into the treatment. Okay, so we're actually at time um, yes, um, you mentioned that you leave, you don't allow anyone to leave unless they're ready and so forth. Is there a limit of how long a person can stay there, number one? And number two, what if they have no place to go? What do, they, what do you do about that? And also, Mr. Fowler, I do go to Market Basket, and that is a level of security there. But this is just one level above where it's 24-7 security. I, I would welcome anything that you and the panel could do for us to put something in writing and give it to us by August. Thank you. Thanks. And then, uh, Councilor Minicello, uh, you'll have the last word. So, to answer the question about time and Tracy's point, these are just people that we're discharging. What we do is we track patients. There is actually, um, in the accountable care organization, there are standards that we are held to. One of our corporate goals on the health plan is actually looking at rate emissions. So it's very important to us that folks don't just leave and there's no follow-up. We're actually designing the treatment all the way through to say, how is it that we can get this person into care, keep them in care, and actually get them better? Because that's really the goal. And that's what our performance is, is being judged on. Around how long they can stay. So the average length of stay on the inpatient site side across the state is about 10 days. And it's a little bit more for the CSS. I was on a call with colleagues from all over the state and the bad news is, because there is a lack of facilities like this, I have colleagues who have patients who have been in those facilities for two years. One facility has someone that's been there for three years. So whether or not, it's not a matter of, well, this person is staying long, they have to leave. Like Tracy said, there are certain standards that folks have to meet, and if there isn't, the appropriate aftercare, that person stays. And again, unfortunately, people are staying way too long sometimes because there just isn't these sort of facilities for them. So it's not a case where we're gonna say, well, you stay 10 days, it's time for you to go. People are gonna stay as long as it takes for them to get the care because again, even the way that, and I'll get a little technical here, the way that the ACO 
reimburses us is based often on quality metrics and we are responsible for someone even after they leave right if someone leaves the state says you're still responsible i think it's like at least 30 days they come and say you're still responsible for that individual so it's very important to us that people are getting the care that they need and they're not just sort of pushed out because again this is not about what my colleague dr henderson Custodial care. This isn't about custodial care or checking a box. This is making sure that we're doing the right things by folks. And if that means that they have to stay a long time and we don't get paid, jokingly, that's the business that Boston Medical Center is in. We're a safety net hospital. We are here to care for those members of our community that very often are left out, that are left behind. And so that's really the focus and not about checking a box and saying we need to move on. Unfortunately, if they need to be there for 30 days, 60 days, that's how long they're going to be there. Because the goal, again, is our goal is to change the trajectory of people's lives through healthcare and surrounding them with other resources. And this is just one piece of that. Thank you. Uh, so I just want to stress how much I appreciate Senator Brady and Representative Cassidy <coughs> sticking out the entire this entire time and listening in the back because I really appreciate everything you do and the advocacy you have for your constituents. And with that, uh, and also please, uh, I want to share our team's gratitude to Councilor Farwell and Michelle for your continuing uh, nudging us, um, and we will continue to um, be responsive to the. Uh, requests that come from through you from the community. Uh, Councilman Chow. Thank you. Um, thank you all for your um, questions. Uh, in, in classic Brockton style, uh, we don't apologize for asking tough questions, and I appreciate the I appreciate the concerns. I, I'm operating on a, an assumption, so. Um, the assumption I'm operating under is that you know we all we're all at home, and my cell phone gets the alert that um, there's a, an elderly person with dementia, and um, you know they're wandering the streets of Brockton. Um, I get those all the time on the weekends. I'm at an out of state, and my cell phone gets that call that someone's. So so I was under the assumption that that's automatically going to be happening if there's if there's some sort of an emergency. If if someone is going to walk away. And that's what I refer to these people as walkaways. If someone's walking away from this facility, uh, they're having a very bad day, a very bad day. So if that's happening, then they're a danger. In my opinion, I'm making the assumption they're a danger to themselves, and perhaps a, a danger to the community because they're having a very bad day and they're leaving a facility where they agreed not to leave because um, one of the groups was going to be um, committing in order to be in order to take up a bed and in that meeting that we had, there was the understanding that they have to commit to stay for the requisite time because if they're not going to commit to that 30-day period or that period, they're going to say, well, we're not going to choose you to come to this facility. We're going to go with the person who wants to help themselves and is going to commit to that 30-day intake in, in, in house time frame because there's plenty of people that want to do this. So to me, I was um, operating that they can be very selective in terms of the people that are coming in there and who are committed to the program. And again, I operated under the assumption, and maybe I shouldn't operate under assumptions, that you know this is not a prison. This is a hospital with multi-layers of security. Um, but even so, if for some reason someone decides to leave, then the police will be um, notified and immediately respond if there's an emergency. Again, a person leaving is having a bad day and they are a danger to themselves or the, or, or the facility or, or the community. So they can't just wander the streets and walk down to the elementary school, which I'm very invested in. As you know, I've been the uh, school committee here for 14 years and I care very much about our kids. Um, and, and again, I'm a neighbor. I live right behind the school, just like all of you. So, um, you know, I appreciate fear of the unknown. And that's what this is. It's a fear of the unknown. And, and I got it too. I, and when I first heard about this facility, I was like, 
uh-oh, what's going to be going on and how is it going to be operating here? And, and I had the luxury uh, of speaking with, with the BMC people more than obviously the community has. So um, I'm not going to be calling in and basically say, oh yes, I'm, I'm, uh, everything's going to be perfect, everything's going to be fine, don't worry about anything. But I know that if there's a danger or if there's uh, some... Oh, okay. If there's an issue, um, the authorities in the community is going to be notified. And I'm going to work on, I, I will, as I said, I will take responsibility for not having the answer uh, for you, ma'am, and the rest of the community. Imagine the politicians taking responsibility, but I will. And I will talk to Chief Perez and find out um, exactly how it works. Because there will be a neighbor alert of some kind, some emergency notification. And what, before everyone leaves, I would love you all to um, give me your names, your email addresses, and your telephone numbers so that A, we can invite you when we find out the day of the open house to come, but also to put you on a sort of Amber Alert or emergency list um, for both the facility as well as um, when I find out from Chief Perez how the details will work and that you will, the community and the neighborhood will get notification. And I will make sure that the neighbors um, I, I'll have to figure out what she's you know, what would be the local sort of circle around the facility, you know, how far out we go. Uh, those houses, in terms of their phone numbers, the emails, that sort of notification will be in that first tier of um, notification, emergency notification, so that if there is ever an emergency or an issue that needs to be, the local community in relation to the facility needs to be aware of, that those are the houses that are going to get it, you know, first first uh, first thing and, and the details of how that will work but there is a, there is a notification system the question is you know how what are the details of that system but please before you leave give me your name your email and your telephone number so that again we can invite you to the open house and you can see the facility firsthand and the layers of security and also for the emergency notification list for both the facility as well as um, you know, the Brockton Police Department, 911, Amber Alert, whatever you want to call the system, I'll have the details and, um, and, and work on those with Chief Perez. Yes, ma'am. Oh, but uh, the telephone numbers as well, because I, you know, the, Paul, Paul has everything. <laughs> I would work with Paul. But, but, but yeah, of course, Paul. Uh, yeah, I have a I have the email list of about 75 residents scattered around uh, Ward One, and so is anybody here not on that list? Has anybody is there anybody here that did not get the email from me about the meeting tonight or about the zoning board meeting on the 14th? This is Paul Weir. I'm Paul Weir. <laughs> Not George Washington. We're very Paul aware that he's Paul Weir. <laughs> okay, so I've got a home. Okay. All right, great, wonderful. Plus All right, one. again, the city, see, this is Brockton style firsthand, exactly. So we're going to work through this, okay? I, again, I, I appreciate everyone's fear. It is fear of the unknown, and I don't have all the answers, and, um, you know, no one can predict every single situation, but safety is job one, and, and I've been very clear with the PMC people that. Um, you know, the neighborhood needs to be safe and needs to feel safe. And, um, you know, we will, I will have the details of how uh, the, the Brockton police will notify people. Um, but, um, you know, I, I use this as an example and, and I, I, when, when I met with the DMC people. And um, I, I know I'm going to get in trouble for this, but um, that's the way I am. Do you remember when uh, everyone was upset about the foxy lady going to open up? There was a big to do. Everyone was going crazy. This is going to be the downfall of the world here. And guess what? It opened up. I never heard. I've been here on the west side since 1982. I, I moved over from the east side. Why not? Because I don't love the east side, but I just love the... I love to get on the highway and get to Boston and get to the Cape Quay. I love the location here on the west side for that reason. A. But B. The Fossil Lady opened up. I've never heard a bad thing about it in terms of not that I go there, I've never been there, but yet I've never heard of an incident there. But the world's not, oh my god, the foxy lady's coming to town. This place is going to be, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, I honestly feel that 
This is going to be similar. I think this is going to open up. And you're going to say, wow, that's a pretty nice building over there. What the heck are they doing there? And, and if something you know, strange happens, again, someone's going to have a very bad day. And these good people here are not going to allow some person that's in distress to themselves or is going to be a danger to the computer to just roll down the street and walk into the Hancock Elementary School you know, and, and, and have an issue. So uh, again, I'm not naive, believe me, but I, I think that, again, Councilor Farwell said it earlier, I think it's going to be much to do about nothing, but safety is job one for all of us. I take that very seriously. The, the BMC people know, you know, I said, look, these people have every right to be concerned. It's the fear of the unknown. We, we, we want to feel safe in our community. And, um, and, and, and I know that, you know, <laughs> if this was a situation where there was going to be a danger or some sort of a problem for the community, but they couldn't sit here, you know, in all honesty, and, and, and pitch what they're pitching to everyone. You know, and they wouldn't do that because they, they are people of credibility. I really do believe that. And, um, and, 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 and I love the, the Brockton toughness, you know. I thought you guys were very well behaved tonight, to be honest with you. I thought you were mild, but that's, but that's just me. But, um, you know, I thank you for coming. Please, um, if, if you want to just um, give me your phone number uh, to say hello, just give me a <laughs> But uh, thanks for coming, and I appreciate everything that you guys will do. And um, I, want, I want everyone to come to that open house. I want to see this place, too. And, um, and then I think that when we get inside the building, it, I think it's going to answer more questions, you know. Uh, so, so we're going to work together. And if anyone has concerns, you know you can always call me, and, and I'll whine and I'll and to them, and they'll have to do what we need them to do. So thank you. Right. And I'll take the fall if there's a problem. Don't, don't get mad at Glenn Farrell. will get mad at me. <laughs> Thank you very much, Councillor. And I also have my business cards in case anyone wants uh, to reach out to me as well. So thank you very much and have a great night. Thank you.